So thank you again for joining us. My name is Emily Coleman, and I represent the insured program of EFAD and the Platform for Agricultural Risk Management, and I'll be the moderator for today. So before we get started, I just want to quickly go over some housekeeping rules. We'll have um, a question and answer session at the end of all the presentations, but you can feel more than free to put your questions as, as we go along in the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, and we'll also monitor them there. Um, and in the chat box also, you'll find some uh, relevant links and contacts that we will put there. So um, you know where to find the recordings, the tools that we're going to be talking about, um, and to get more answers in case we don't get round to everyone today. So today you can also see on your screen, I'm joined by four speakers from the Microinsurance Centre at Milliman. Um, and Milliman, uh, Microinsurance Centre is a specialised unit of Milliman that's dedicated to developing valuable microinsurance, or we also say inclusive insurance, and risk management solutions for low-income people globally. So the Microinsurance Centre recently wrapped up a project that was funded by EFAD called Managing Risks for Rural Development, or MRRD for short. And this project worked on inclusive insurance, so always for low-income people, in um, China, Ethiopia, and Georgia. And during this project, they had different experiences in developing um, inclusive insurance solutions, which all started from um, understanding of what the customer or the beneficiary wants and needs. So we um, developed some of these learnings into practical tools um, that you can find on the insured toolbox on EFAD. We'll put the link in the chat box. Um, and we developed these together with Microinsurance Center and the insured program at EFAD. And these are what the speakers will outline today, together with um, why they did them and, and the country experience around them as well. So before jumping into the first presentation, I just wanted to ask you one poll question to understand a bit more about you and your interest in um, inclusive insurance. So you'll see a poll that will pop on, up on your screen and you'll have um, one minute to answer it. So I see the poll now and it's just one question really just to understand a bit more about who is in the room um, and what your interest is and what your experience is. So you can see that the question is, um, why are you interested in customer-centric inclusive insurance? And you can select more than one answer, um, but there are four, four options. You might be designing uh, products. Um, you might be funding uh, projects that include inclusive insurance. Um, you might see it as one element um, in other work that you are doing, um, or you might simply just be curious to, to learn a bit more, given that also we're talking about how to do some things and tools um, on, this, on this session. So you'll just have a, a bit longer. I can't see the countdown, but um, if you just take a moment to answer the poll, selecting more than one answer, if you wish, and then the results will be shared. Great, okay, so um, I can see the results on my screen. And what is um, interesting, I think, is that 60% uh, are curious to learn about the topic, which is great, because I think that's really where um, we started and also why we developed the tools. And then um, a, a lot of people also are, are either designing products or um, seeing inclusive insurance as a complement to the work that they're doing. So um, that's great to know a bit about uh, where you're coming from. Thank you for that. So I think with that, I can um, jump into the, the first speaker to speak about her experience and, and one of the tools in particular. Um, so I would like to hand over to Queenie Chow, who will speak a bit about um, the rapid prototyping method and the tool that we published on its usage in inclusive insurance. Over to you, Queenie. Thanks, Emily. 
Um, let me share screen and I believe you should be able to see that. Um, okay, so thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Um, as Emily mentioned, I wanted to share a bit about uh, the Bro uh, rapid prototyping tool that we have created, which is based on the human centered design approach. Um, you might be asking, uh, what exactly is human-centered design? Um, human-centered design is a creative approach to problem solving and a process that starts off with the people that you're designing for and ends with a new solution that's tailored made to their needs. Um, so this session is only, uh, unfortunately, with the time, um, that a short introduction on human-centered design or what we call HCD, uh, rapid prototyping and the resulting tool that we have created from the um, EFAD MRLD project that we did. Um, I highly encourage you to take uh, more time out of your day to check out our tool which is a bit more comprehensive online and if you're interested in the topic I'm sure you can also follow some of the posts that we've done on that as well. So in a nutshell um, human-centered design is about empathy it's about building deep empathy with the people you're designing for um, it's the capacity to be able to step into someone's shoes to understand their lives and to start solving problems from their perspective. All you have to do is to em uh, empathize, understand them, and bring them along with you in the journey, in the design journey, which you'll see later on in our case study um, in, in where we've been working on this project in China. Human-centered design is also about getting your hands dirty, uh, quite literally here, learning by creating it, uh, learning by doing. The objective of prototyping is to make your idea more tangible um, and place it in the hands of the people which you're creating the solution for. Uh, last but not least, human-centered design is also about learning from failures. Um, I like to not think about them as a failure. I like to think that it's a design experiment which you're going to learn. Um, and inherently, it's an iterative um, approach to solving problem because you need to take feedback from the people we're designing for um, and how and it's important for the solution to evolve as well. It's when you're continuing iterating, refining and improving our work that we put our place, put ourselves in a place where we have more ideas, um, get a variety of approach, unlock our creativity and arrive at a quicker, at a uh, successful solution. Um, so what exactly is a prototype? Uh, I wanted to start off with the quote, um, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a prototype is worth a thousand meetings. And you'll see later on that there's many good reasons for us to um, prototype. Um, test to get early feedback, um, quick alignment between the stakeholders through co-creation, which we certainly saw in the case of China, um, where we were building um, insurance for um, smallholder farmers. Um, learn by doing and putting customers in the center of creation. Put products into the hands of customers faster. It's about speed and it's also about reducing risk and cost in the scheme development. But for me, the biggest why of why prototype is remembering um, the times where uh, your company spent so much time, money and resources on building something that you come out to find customers don't really want. Um, and this is really the spirit of the squiggle you see on this slide here. Um, you see the top one where typically you roll out a product and then, you know, you might remember your team um, scrambling to change the product because there's a massive reality out there. You roll out and there's lots of things that was quite different when you roll it out. Um, but if you could embrace the squiggle, which is the second one on the um, down, you want to embrace it, make it, test it and revise it. So. Uh, you bring the uncomfortable and messy experience earlier on, um, such that when you're actually ready to implement, when you're actually executing and rolling it out, you're ultimately saving time and money. So in, in this slide here, you see the cycle of microinsurance scheme development process. Um, you'll see here that prototyping takes place within the scheme development process. And prior to the prototyping, the development team needs to also have a good understanding of the landscape um, in which the prototype will be created. The prototype is also important to emphasize the iterative process uh, within the, both the product and the scheme development. It's quite likely that you need to learn from the prototype and it's necessary to go through rounds and rounds of design to revive, redesign and shape in the, um, the details. There will be 
quite a few times before the scheme can be finalized um, and pilot test. Um, and, you, and for example, in the case of insurance, you will need to redefine with getting more data for adjustments or potentially reprice for the product. Prototyping is important to be repeated during the pilot stage in order to continuously refine. Um, and this is when the squiggleness and the messiness comes into play. Let me take you through what um, what we've quickly on how we've um, what what we have been doing in China. Um, and this is the as Emily mentioned, um, it's a project funded by EFAD, managing risk for rural development, promoting microinsurance innovation. Um, in this particular case, we went to uh, China in South Shanxi, uh, where we were uh, working with small scale farmers um, on creating products that suited for their needs. Uh, we hosted a week long prototype workshop. Um, and prior to that, we also did field research um, conducted with these farmers. Um, all of these were conducted in um, collaboration with the local stakeholder, uh, Northwest Agriculture University um, in Shanxi. Uh, in the innovation workshop, we also brought along um, 70 Triggers, which is a uh, behavioral change labs, as well as um, our team um, and also our insurer's partner, Groupama Avec. Based on some of the research, uh, based on some of the research we did, um, we agreed on some of the customer challenges, uh, which uh, which was which we were attempting to resolve. And I think that's very important. A lot of the times, you might find that actually your team don't always have a consistent problem that you're solving. Uh, we had a diverse team across different departments of the insurance company where the prototyping team brainstormed together on a creative product and scheme ideas. The idea didn't only come from one person, it came from the group um, together. We took a very simple approach, which um, I think you'd like to um, potentially use it on other ideas as well. Um, it's called a four steps pitch test. Um, and this is really a pitch test is a rapid prototype of an idea. Um, building onto four phases, which is the problem, solution, how, and why. So first you define the problem and something along, so you know how, so that's defining the problem, understanding from your customer whether that is a real problem. And then you outline your solution. So luckily there is ABC and you go on to explain how it works. And finally, you articulate the benefits in the end. So it's a four step pitch test where you use on just testing an idea with somebody. Uh, when you apply these four step pitch tests, um, you'll realize, you'll come to realization that potentially a lot of assumptions that you have might not hold true, which is something that uh, we had experience in this, um, in this session. Over the two days that we had, the team met with five cooperative managers, 15 farmers in, uh, in Mianxian to get their feedback. Uh, some of uh, and these are some of the testing materials completed. You'll see that it's um, I would say it's a bit like a children's drawing. It's not really as sophisticated as you as you think. And this is exactly why we do it. Um, customers are presented with an idea that's clearly not ready, um, and that allows them to put inputs into your product development. It's allowing them to give you ideas and to give you uh, real feedback that they feel about the product. Uh, these are some of the products that we've come up with. Uh, which we tested included frost index insurance, bundling with in insect sticky boards. Um, others included revenue protection with SMS alerts on weather. Uh, there's also the disability insurance, which cover a bee sting, um, something that farmers really worried about in this region. Based on some of the feedback from the farmers during the testing, um, our insurer, insurer partner, Grupama Beck, and our team went on to design um, the details of the frost index insurance product, um, one of the ideas pitched. We then conducted an additional round of prototype testing by deploying the sales pitch in qualitative interviews with um, additional uh, 44 farmers. Um, here are some of the marketing materials mock up to explain how the frost index insurance product worked. Um, and you can see that it's uh, specifically tailored not only in Chinese, but um, some of the cult cultural components where we use the traditional Chinese um, agriculture lunar calendar, we call uh, Longli, uh, and adapt it to present uh, the index by a thermometer for our target audience, because we found that that was something quite confusing for them. 
Uh, I hope that this short presentation um, I have done showcased the importance of customer centricity uh, and how rapid prototyping can be applied in the context of um, affordable insurance for poor rural clients, bringing together different departments team in sparking innovation and creativity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Queenie. I, I really liked seeing uh, practically all of the steps and uh, how it related to uh, the actual work that you carried out as well. Um, I got one question that I just want to squeeze in now before moving on to the next presentation. Um, I saw you mentioned about the four um, different types of products or, or product offerings. Um, and you also said that you only took a week to do the market research. So it's been asked, is a week a, a typical time? Is it enough time to do this type of market research? Yeah, great question. Uh, certainly, I think, um, as you saw in the cycle, that the prototype is only one step of the process. So certainly, one week is an extremely short period of time in creating a product. Uh, typically, if you work in an insurer, you'll know that it takes months or occasionally even year to develop a product and roll out into the market. Um, so I think what's important to emphasize is that before the prototyping stage, which so we saw the prototyping stage as one week, um, before and after you continue to reiterate. So before the after the week long, we also had um, another few weeks of sort of reiterating that process. So the marketing material, for example, was developed in the second um, second lot of workshops and, and development. Um, but, you know, in the co-creation workshop or innovation workshop, or some people call it a design sprint, uh, we had um, many of the key stakeholders in the same room and we were able to make decisions at the same time, which is where that one week long is important. And I think the other thing to emphasize is also the background research, the market research we did prior to the week long workshop. Uh, we also did, uh, and I think you probably remember Emily that we conducted a roadmap for China. Um, there was a lot of discussions prior to the actual week long innovation workshop as well. So certainly before and after there's a lot more work. So it's not only the one week that you can, um, you work on the product. <laughs> but it's a key moment to get everybody to, together Certainly. to make the decisions and to discuss the feedback. Yeah, yeah, and certainly in the case of this um, this case study uh, in China, we had a very, very dedicated um, insurer who was very, very keen to launch. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly there's other parts that we could have um, potentially involved other stakeholders to get their buy-in, but certainly in this case, the insurer who was in this workshop was, um, and across their many departments, they were very, um, they were very keen to do something um, and create something together. Mm. Okay, I think that's key. That's an important point. Um, thanks a lot, Queenie. Uh, we might come back with uh, further questions for sure. you later on. Um, but for the moment, um, I'd like to focus more on delving deeper into really what um, Queenie was saying about the, the customer uh, research or the research from, from the field and from the the farmers and the potential beneficiaries. So um, another tool uh, that I'm sure you're all familiar with is focus group discussions. Um, and our next speaker, Mariah Mateo Sapong, will uh, speak about how the focus group discussions were used in inclusive insurance product development um, in their project, and also a bit about the tool published on this topic. Um, I'm seeing some questions popping up in the chat, which is great. So you can keep them coming either directly to me or, or in general, and we will get to them. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the tool we developed on how to use focus group discussions in the development of inclusive insurance. And this one, along with the rapid prototyping tool that Queenie just presented on, are both already published on EFED's insurance toolkit. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues will share a link shortly to this specific tool. Um, so why this tool and why focus group discussions? So um, I think when we speak to insurance companies around the world, and if you're an insurer here on this call, I'm sure this would resonate with you, but there's a dearth of demand side information. Um, and if we wanna design customer centric products, I think you know we should speak directly to clients, especially for um, particular types of information. So focus group discussions are one way that we can obtain this level of detail about our inclusive insurance customers. Um, so for the MRRD project, we did carry out focus group discussions to understand the demand side in all three of the countries that we worked in, in China, Georgia, and Ethiopia. 
but we did them in a variety of ways um, and address different topics with our FGDs, um, which I'll come back to in a little bit. But, and we use them at different points in the inclusive insurance development process. So um, part of the reason that we developed this tool and we're talking about this topic today is um, sometimes the term gets thrown around, you know, just carry out some FGDs. Um, and I think this helps to demystify and break down what that actually means in the inclusive insurance context um, and makes it a little bit more, seem more manageable for people that are implementing these types of projects. So just so we're all speaking the same language here, um, a focus group discussion or an FGD is the qualitative research method. You bring a small group of people together from a target market that you're interested in and um, you discuss a specific topic in general. Um, so the, the audience for this tool that we developed is um, donors and also their implementing partners that are working on inclusive insurance projects. And the tool number one is supposed to facilitate planning for focus group discussions. And number two, it's also um, provides practical support on how to actually implement FGDs. The tool is broken up into two basic parts. So the first part of the tool um, overviews seven key topics that are typically addressed or information is obtained on those topics via focus group discussions. And we also linked those seven topics with the corresponding part of the inclusive insurance product development cycle. Um, and then at the end of the tool, we also provided sample question guides that linked to those seven topical areas. And the second part of the tool is completely focused on implementation of the FGDs and really give some checklists and things to consider when you're planning for FGDs and implementing them. So back to part one, um, we do separate the different types of topics that inclusive insurance topics that can be addressed with FGDs into these seven categories. So these are the seven um, topics that we address. And just to give an example, so if you're looking at trying to get information about the general nature of risks, so not even looking at the insurance topic yet. Um, you might ask questions that then give you information on insurable risks, how to prioritize coverages and identify appropriate amounts of coverage. If you already have an inclusive insurance product prototype developed, um, then you might bring together a focus group discussion to get feedback on that prototype. So you could get feedback on specific aspects of the product and maybe even understand willingness to pay for um, a particular solution. And just to give an example, uh, before I mentioned how FGDs can be used in many different ways, um, and of course, to get different information, from the MRRD project in Ethiopia, we actually had these A through C topic areas we had a lot of that information from a public good demand study that had been carried out in the country already. And then we carried out focus group discussions on topics D through G with our target market for the project. So that gives you an example of kind of the mixing and matching of topics and methods that could go into inclusive insurance design. And as mentioned, we do have sample question guides in the tool. So this is a screenshot from the tool of one of the question guides and a zoom in on one of the questions. So we have core questions, probing questions, and then some considerations and suggestions for the moderator on types of activities you could do with the group to help bring out answers to the specific question. In the second part of the guide, um, we focus on implementation. So we have a nice table that lays out the different stakeholders and roles that participate, that can participate in FGDs. And then we give descriptions and characteristics for each, as well as what their responsibilities um, should be pre-FGD, during the FGD, FGD and post-FGD. 
And we also give some guidance on research plans. So I think this is something that stood out to us, um, not only in this project, but in all of the projects we carry out that there's quite a lot of planning and preparation that needs to go into um, proper FGD um, research. And so we have different elements of what an FGD research plan might include. Um, and just to highlight training. So training of the moderator, we've found is quite important. Even doing some practice FGDs ahead of time can be really helpful because a lot of the effectiveness of the FGD hinges on a good moderator. Otherwise, you can do a one-on-one -on -one interview, for example, instead of an FGD. But being able to facilitate an actual discussion and um, make people feel comfortable and elicit responses is uh, takes some training and a good moderator. And then we also give um, an outline and some pointers on what an actual session guide, so the, you know, the tool, um, or the planning file you would create for the FGD session, what that might include. Um, so we have a sort of checklist on that as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Mariah. It's good to see um, this um, point, of, point of view. Um, I've just seen a question come in, which is why I'm hesitating. So I think that I'll just ask you this one question and then other questions we can get to also um, at the end in the Q&A session. So the question from Tom Shaw is specifically on um, FGDs. And um, he's wondering if it also covers issues of, um, of claim settlement. So do you ask, do you address that? What happens if, um, if they don't make a claim like, and how insurance works compared to something like savings? So he's saying, does it cover the topic of why I don't get a refund if I didn't have a claim? Um, and how do you really address um, insurance, um, maybe to, to participants that are not even familiar with insurance? Um, how do you sort of explain those, those topics to not raise yeah, the expectations you. as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. So for the first question about claims and renewals, um, you can definitely do an FGD later in the product development process after you've launched the product and then you wanna get feedback from customers. So I think that that could be, if you want to get, especially if you wanna deep dive on um, really understand the issues of what happened with the claims process and what you can do better to map out a new process with the insurer or whoever the partners are, I think you could absolutely do that um, post launching the product and have like a feedback uh, FGD session. And then in terms of customers that might not understand insurance, so the first few categories, um, topical areas that we have in the guide, um, the nature of risks and also risk management and coping um, and knowledge of insurance perceptions, those are geared towards customers that maybe don't have experience with insurance. So it's actually getting at what kind of risks do you face and how do you cope with them? Um, a lot of the examples in the guide are focused on agricultural risks, um, but it doesn't have to be um, geared towards that topic. But yes, yeah, so check out the guides A through C. And we do have some guidance on there as well about how to explain what insurance is, the concept of insurance, um, and have that discussion with the FGD participants. Thanks, Maria. Uh, a lot of people talking about FGDs now um, in the chat. I just want to ask you uh, one more uh, question before moving on, and the other ones we will uh, get round to. Um, it's about a willingness and ability to pay. So how far do you get into those issues? And if, for example, this point was by Junje Perez, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, um, who's saying that, okay, in a discussion, um, clients might say, or potential clients might say, yes, or it all sounds great, we, we want it. But then when it actually comes to you know, putting money on the table for the product, so to speak, then it's a different story. Mm -hmm. How much do you get into those issues um, in the focus group discussions? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So that's definitely something 
that can happen and maybe you will have to launch and adjust later on. But, um, but during the, uh, but you can get some willingness to pay information or at least initial ideas on it if you have a prototype um, and something that's almost fully designed and ready to go. Um, and, and it seems like a real solution for the group gathered. Um, we have had some success in that via FGDs and then also via one-on-one -on -one interviews. But definitely, I mean, it's, it's true that point about when it's actually time to pull out the money, things could change. And then you might have to um, revisit, uh, you know, it's, that's why it's important to get feedback and adjust during your pilot. That's an important part of the pilot phase, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So I think we've also heard in the chat and also I think uh, Queenie was saying it's an iterative process, but or, or for, for a long period as well um, to, to test also what's being designed as well as during the design. Um, so I think that's important to remember. All right, thanks very much, Mariah. We will be um, addressing the questions in the chat um, or at the end. Uh, for now, though, I just want to hand over to John Carroll, who's our next speaker, um, and he will be discussing about community engagement and specifically for um, a case on index insurance um, under the project. So um, over to you, John. Hi, John, we can't hear you just in case you're still muted. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I believe you can see my screen as well. So thank you, Emily, for introducing. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about community engagement and index insurance. And unlike the other two tools, this is considered a knowledge brief. Um, so we are using this tool to really explore the benefits and the rationale for including uh, community engagement activities within index insurance initiatives. All right, so really the objective of this is to think differently about the role of that community members can play on, um, on the, any type of index insurance project. Um, and this is designed for anyone who's really an implementer. So we think a lot of the development sector could be interested in this and insurers, uh, distribution channels, donors, consultants. So we wanna see this uh, widely used. Um, so let me just, um, community engagement, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be applied to a lot of different areas, but why specifically index insurance? Um, and I think one of the really key reasons why we wanted to link these two topics together is because index insurance can be pretty complex at times. Um, and, you know, so a lot of times you use satellite data, and that's really what's going to determine triggers to decide if you get a payout for your insurance plan. Um, and that can be very intangible. And whenever you have a project that is um, based on intangible concepts, it can be very hard to trust and to actually want to buy into. Um, and especially when you're working in low income rural areas. So we want, um, you know, we wanted this knowledge brief to be able to think more about tangibility and building up trust and just making things more relevant for the community. So before I talk more about the knowledge brief, I just wanna just define, um, this is defined in, in the um, knowledge brief as well, but how we look at community engagement, um, we're looking at this in terms of community members that are enabled to play an active role within the project. Um, and I think the key word there is active. We don't wanna just treat them as passive beneficiaries. We want them to be really engaged, able to, um, positively influence um, the project's goals, activities, the impact of the project. Um, so one way to look at this is by um, saying that an engaged community member is someone that might participate um, throughout the project activities, um, buy into the initiative. So maybe they're investing their time or their resources, they're actually purchasing the, the insurance product. 
um, providing feedback. Um, this is just going to help the products become better, the processes become better, and then proactively promoting the insurance products um, to other members of the community, spreading, spreading the word. So within this knowledge brief, we um, drew a lot on our lessons learned from the, the project that we worked with in Tigray, Ethiopia. And we drew out five different principles for community engagement. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna give a really high level overview here, but um, we, you know, the first one is building a model of trust. And this is something that comes first because it's really the foundation of everything. We want to be able to really make sure community members trust and that's that's gonna influence so, everything that's to come. Um, and one quick easy way that we've uh, focused on this was thinking through at the setup, who is the project team that's actually visiting the community, having consistent visits and faces that they can see. Uh, valuing local roles and input. So this should be throughout the whole project life cycle and thinking through who are the leaders, who are we working with, who's representing and making sure there's diversity in roles, gender, et cetera. Um, integrating participatory components into research. This one is difficult. You have to be very intentional with this, but if you can specifically design research that includes um, the community and having roles for them in mind, um, so they're participating in the research. That's just really going to help the community understand every all the data that's being collected. And when you understand the data, you understand problems better. You understand what the potential solutions could be better. Um, you're just going to be more invested. And transparently sharing back data to communities. Um, so many times we collect a lot of data, and you might bring it back to an office and um, and just process the data there on your computers, but but really, if we can bring back this data and share it to the community, that's going to really um, allow for us to be able to just get more inputs, understand things even from a clearer perspective and make sure that um, really what we're understanding and interpreting is matching what the community is seeing and, and what their expectations are for moving forward. And then all this you know, transitions into using the data. So all everything that we, we did do in the community, we really wanna be able to use that to improve the insurance initiative. So this is just one example. Um, one thing that we did do as a concrete way um, to focus on tangibility. And first, I just wanna start out this slide with saying that the product that we did work with um, was an index product that was triggered by um, satellite, what the satellites indicated. Um, but as an effort to make this more tangible, we did activities where we collected ground data with community members. And so you can see here in the pictures, um, this first one, there's, um, we built rain gauges. Um, so they're just simple rain gauges, but there were sturdy and they were, we were able to train um, community members how to record levels on a consistent basis of the actual rainfall. Um, and then in a different activity, we had photos. Uh, we taught community members how they could teach, uh, how they could take photos of a consistent location throughout the rainy season and see the crop growth. Um, so these activities just, just help to make things more tangible to begin to understand um, just the concept of measuring and how this, this, is, how this ties in. Um, it, it really helped our project a lot because we were able to see and make sure that the expectations and what the community was seeing on the ground was matching what we were seeing from the satellites. Um, so if you do this, it, it can help make your project even better as well. So my hope really is that um, you'll read the knowledge brief and you'll learn even more and just uh, really think creatively about how you can add in more activities for community engagement into your projects. So thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and so just to clarify for that knowledge brief, um, just as a reminder, it's not yet published, but it will be published on the same uh, link that Mariah shared on the insurance uh, toolkit on the EFAD website. Um, so there's one uh, specific question uh, for you, John, from uh, Samir Mahmood, and it's about trust um, and, and specifically farmer trust. 
Um, and how do you address this in, um, in the work that, that you were doing? And how do you help to boost the trust? Um, did, did you see yeah. that it, it was uh, increased through the community engagement that you were talking about? Yeah, I think, I think for us, one thing I'd really like to mention is just um, when we had, when we formed the team, we, we had a local project coordinator on the team. And this was someone that um, was familiar, you know, with insurance uh, from a nearby city, but also familiar with the, you know, the rural area and was able to go out and really, um, I think he was really key for trust because he was able to communicate things clearly, how, you know, and, and appropriately. And he was very available. He was that consistent face that I mentioned. Um, and you know, if the the leaders, even if they were, if they needed to have questions answered, they could call him. I think it just, it opened up a lot of channels so that people had answers. Because so many times there are so many, you know, you might listen to a, a session about insurance and you still probably have questions. Um, you might not know what to ask at the time, but they were able to always follow up with the same consistent person. And I think that's just one really key way. Okay, thanks a lot, John. So for our final presentation, I'd like to hand over to Katie Buse, um, and she'll talk about another type of agricultural insurance, but livestock insurance, and um, how the Microinsurance Centre at Milliman designed uh, livestock insurance when really they were at a starting point where there was not really any information to do this. Um, and also a bit about the, the knowledge brief that's going to be added to the toolkit on that topic. So over to you, Katie. Thanks, Emily. Um, as Emily mentioned, I'll share a tool, a knowledge brief today that stems from our work on livestock insurance in Georgia. So as a little context, um, based on a couple rounds of demand research using FGDs like in the first tool um, that Mariah discussed and prototyping like Queenie discussed, interviews that we'd had with stakeholders and EFAD, we um, had determined that livestock mortality insurance could be a valuable risk management tool for smallholder dairy farmers. And the basic product concept was that um, a product would pay a fixed lump sum in case a dairy cow dies due to any reason whatsoever. Um, however, when we approached insurers with this idea, we got a lot of pushback. Uh, the key problem was a lack of data on dairy cow mortality, which was necessary to price the product. I think lack of data is probably a problem many of us have faced. Um, so it, in this case, insurers were just guesstimating the rate at which productive dairy cows might die in a given year. Uh, we were getting rates like 10% and then they would add a buffer on top of that, which then of course this translates to unnecessarily high premiums, which smallholders could either not afford or were not willing to pay. So of course not very client centric. Um, and we believed based on the field research we had done with farmers and others that the insurers were dramatically overestimating this mortality rate. So our solution was to just go get the data ourselves. Uh, we designed a simple mortality study. We worked with the Georgian Farmers Association to collect the data. They were a key stakeholder working in the dairy value chain. They conducted the study by phone with about 500 small to mid-sized dairy farmers, which gave us about 14,000 data points with which to construct a more accurate mortality rate of productive dairy cows. And then the results of the study were shared publicly as well as in detail with insurers to help them develop a product that would be more affordable and, and client-centric. So the, the actual tool that we have developed for the insurance toolkit is a knowledge brief based on this experience. Um, it discusses how to address data gaps to, to better develop insurance. It's aimed at um, product project designers and implementers who are working on livestock insurance, though I believe it could be useful for other types of insurance as well on a more abstract level. The objectives of the tool are to discuss the benefits, opportunities, or challenges for collecting such data to fill in gaps when you're working in data sparse environments and to share this concrete example and lessons that we found from our work on how this can be done in a practical way. So I will just share a couple of the key highlights or lessons that are uh, outlined in the briefing note. 
first, the, the importance of asking the right questions in order to get enough data to make a feasible um, conclusion about the mortality rate, but also important to keep it as short as possible to be a feasible and straightforward exercise. And the briefing note includes a checklist of key questions to include. Um, the next is that data collection on mortality can be done inexpensively and um, efficiently by phone, though not in all contexts. Um, it's relatively straightforward compared to some of the other client-centered research that we've been talking about. Uh, two key factors in this are access to a farmer database, as well as support from trusted local stakeholders. In this case, it was the Georgian Farmers Association. Another key lesson is involving insurers before and after the data collection. So beforehand, getting their inputs on, on the questions and buy-in that they would actually use this in their decisions later. And then after the data collection, allowing them to, to explore the uh, anonymized data themselves um, to feel like they can come to their own conclusions. And then a final important lesson was, or opportunity, is leveraging the results beyond just the price point and, and how it impacts the premium um, and even beyond insurance. So for example, in, if you're understanding the top causes why dairy cows die, this can inform other risk management efforts such as informational campaigns on how to treat or prevent certain diseases, for example. Um, and the overall goal of the tool is to inspire or guide readers on how to plan for data collection into product design if you believe you could be in a situation where data is sparse, which is more often than not, um, it can be done. And the exercise doesn't have to be a huge expensive undertaking in order for it to be useful. And throughout the brief, we provide uh, details from the Georgian case as examples. And then finally, just to, to not leave you hanging on what actually happened um, with our study. So the findings indicated that the mortality rate was much lower than what insurers had been guessing, about 1.6% each year. We had also asked for information on how many cows farmers sold each year and why. And so that led to another 0.8% of cows in a given year sold to illness or accident, which we felt could be things that would lead to an insurance claim. Um, so how this impacted the premium before the study uh, we had managed to negotiate with an insurer to offer the product at a 5% risk rate um, plus a 2% markup for expenses. And then based on the data from the study, a new insurer was willing to reduce that risk rate down to 2.9, which was the 1.6 deaths, the 0.8 sales, and then a 0.5 loading or buffer um, plus the 2% expenses. So the result was the overall premium was down by 30%. And that was enough to bring it into the affordable and willing to pay range based on some exercises that we had done with farmers. And the take up did go up quite a, quite a bit. Um, so overall, we felt this made the investment in getting the data worthwhile from our perspective. Um, this knowledge brief is not yet available on the website, but it should be coming out soon. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Katie. Um, it's nice to see also another type of example and how you've you've overcome these challenges by really going back to the basics, really going to the people that that know and um, and then putting it all together uh, to help develop um, insurance. There's a question from uh, Malkachu, and I hope that I'm interpreting it correctly about the premium rates. Um, and I think what it's asking is. Um, how do you have ensure a balance between um, a, a lower premium rate for, for a customer, um, but then sustainability um, for the insurers, for the, for the market over the long term? And, and do you have any sort of insights from the Georgia experience in, in this regard? That's a great question, Malkachu, and that's always the challenge, right? At the Microinsurance Center, we're always talking about the magical balance between client value and, and a business case for insurers and, and distribution channels. And so that was something that we were always looking at throughout the Georgian case. We never wanted to push um, the underwriters to write below what was sustainable for them. 
Um, we just wanted them to write at a fair rate that, that matched the risk. Um, and so that's where that expense loading came, the expense margin came on um, and the insurers did play around with that. And other ways to do it are to play with the, the product coverage level so you can bring it into an affordable rate um, that still makes sense for the insurer, but then is more affordable to, to the farmer. Um, I don't think I have specific numbers or anything that we did in Georgia, but certainly that is a, a tough challenge on, on balancing that. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Katie. Um, now I think we can open up for, um, for other questions to everybody. Um, and there have been quite a few questions in the chat box, so we really appreciate that. Um, the team have been answering them where they can, but there are a few just to pull out that perhaps haven't been answered yet. So there's, um, there's, there's one with regarding to claims payment uh, from Junjay Perez, and um, they're asking, it, did the, how, how did the project experience the moment of um, claims payment? Um, and was that a moment that you used to engage with the community to strengthen the trust? Um, and also, uh, in addition to that, how was education carried out um, alongside the, the product? So I, I guess that was more um, in relation to Ethiopia um, and trust, but it could be also perhaps something from, from any of your experiences. So anything on education that you did within the schemes? Was that, for example, starting in the focus groups and then continued afterwards? Um, and also when there were payouts, was there anything, did you see trust improve? Um, and did you do anything to, to um, to to highlight the payouts i think katie maybe if you could just share we, some thoughts on that yeah we did on the georgia case we definitely promoted the the payouts to farmers um we did an awareness campaign um through facebook and through the georgia and farmers association that that highlighted just insurance and risk management in general and then the insurance product specifically and then also shared a claim story um, from farmers. Um, we definitely saw the distribution channels we had used were NGOs of, of livestock farmers, um, as well as dairy factories. And we did see word of mouth throughout these when, when there was a claim and it did lead to renewals of products and more like friends of farmers purchasing. Um, so highlighting that was definitely key in the Georgia example. Okay, great. It shows the importance of um, um, community engagement, which is what John talked about, really all the different processes of uh, delivering a product. So you have to think from assessing the need to the design of the product and the scheme, um, then to the actual delivery and all the way to the payouts and how that's functioning. So I think that's a, an important point to raise. Thanks, Katie. Then there's quite a technical question that I'm wondering if I can throw to Queenie um, from um, Isaiah, which is really, I think, about what we call basis risk in index insurance. Um, so it's when um, the index insurance product does not um, pay out when it should, or conversely, it might pay out when it should not. Um, and so he's asking, you know, how can insurance companies uh, reduce that, that risk for them? Um, I think 
Well, well, there's two sides. I think the basis risk um, will ultimately exist. I think um, unless you've got really, really good data points and good prediction and estimation uh, for the indexes, you're going to ultimately have basis risk. So I guess good data is probably the answer to how we can technically improve the product as we progress. Um, I think there's also another component about the community or understanding from the customer. And I think that's where um, we did some focus in China, where in the materials, it was quite important for customers to actually understand how the index work, because I think um, as most many of you who has worked with index will come to realize one of the biggest challenge is for customers to understand that basis risk. Um, and in there, we sort of used very simple diagrams as opposed to very complicated indexes. Um, you know, it was a thermometer and it was quite clear to customers. It was, you know, at which point will they get paid out? And I think that that made it simpler to understand. So I think there's two folds. One is sort of how to iteratively do the prediction and the index is better. And then there's also the second fold of educating the customer to understand that it's not exactly, you know, what you're going to get paid out is what the disaster would be, but that um, it's going to be paid out on the index. Thanks, Queenie. Um, another one for Katie um, on Georgia and livestock insurance. Can you say, can you boil it down to one biggest challenge? This is from uh, May uh, Goodelos. Um, can you boil it down to one one challenge for insuring livestock, or um, or do you see there's many many challenges? There's there are definitely many, um, and many that would relate to most inclusive insurance products, such as distribution and the trust. Uh, many of the things we've been talking about, getting the right information, maybe a unique ish challenge for livestock insurance was um, in working with the insurer to manage the fraud and to overcome their uh, desire to manage the fraud and work with ways that aren't too restrictive that will make the product too complicated, but still um, keep it simple. Um, so we had, you know, things in the policy, like all if everything's included and everything's covered, then you're not trying to sneak in something that's excluded to be something that's included, for example, um, things like that. So yeah, working around the fraud was definitely a big challenge in working with the insurer. Hmm. I think that's interesting because it also highlights um, what might be relevant for other types of microinsurance. So we've spoken a lot about specific examples that are related to agricultural insurance. And we've spoken about index insurance, that's data, but the livestock example in, in Georgia is uh, indemnity. So it's based really on, uh, on claims assessments and, and there is then pot more potential for fraud. So, um, you know, that could also be applicable for other types of microinsurance like health etc. Um, so I think that's an important point. Thank you. And then um, I think a one to end on is from Tom Shaw, who's asking um, everybody, what's what's your opinion on from the four different types of tools and, and methods that were presented today? Um, which one do you think is most effective for policy renewal rates? And I would add uptake to that as well. Do you think there's one that you could single out that say, okay, if you can just do that one, just do that, this? Queenie? Uh, I feel this is a tough question. <laughs> um, I think, for me, I, I think it's not just about the tools. I think certainly the tools is important, but I think we, we sort of alluded to what the product is, um, how the product function is also quite important. Um, so certainly, you know, you need to reiterate and, you know, many of the principles stay the same, but I think ultimately the product has to be good and that's how renewal rates come in. Um, customers have to have a good experience on the product in order to renew. So I think that's, um, that's for me the most important thing. I think it's having a good product ultimately. It's not about um, only the application of tools. Yeah, and I think the underlying thread for all of the tools we presented on was basically that we talked directly to the people that use the product. Um, so that's not a specific method that's better than the other, but just the fact that there were there was trust built and their perspectives were included. Yeah, starting from the very beginning, um, not not as an afterthought. 
So, okay, I think we've reached the, the top of the hour. So I'd like to really thank um, all of our presenters. Um, I found it interesting. I also learned some things myself. And of course, um, everybody for attending and all of your great questions as well. I see there are a couple that have um, come again in the uh, chat box. So we might just stick around for a few more minutes just to answer those. And then we have also put in the chat box um, the contact of Mariah in case um, you have any um, unanswered questions. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or your evening, wherever you are. Thank you.